Hello. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, so everyone can appreciate a well-designed restaurant, uh, especially an operator when good design is also good for business. Um, Oliver Hasselgrieve is founder and creative director of Home Studios, which works on hotel, restaurant, residential, and retail projects. Um, and Terry Coughlin is a director of operations with Union Square Hospitality Group. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about two restaurants, um, Cafe Marquio and Vinny Fritti today. Um, They're pro both projects that uh, Oliver and Terry have worked on together. So I'm going to start um, with you, Oliver. I have a few general questions, and then we'll talk specifics. Uh, so generally, um, when you think about a well-designed restaurant, is uh, what comes first? Is it aesthetics or function of the space? Uh, I think you can't kind of divide the two. Um, we certainly start with uh, function, but that is usually kind of evolving as the um, design evolves. So it's really like a parallel path. Um, we've done somewhat over 40 projects at this point. Um, so, and I used to work my first few years. When I moved here, I worked as a um, bartender, barback, uh, waiter. So we really take kind of function seriously. Um, all the dimensions, I mean, all the critical path, egress is, is very important. You know, in general, we're kind of trying to raise the temperature in the room, uh, kind of create an, an alchemy or an energy. And if the bartender has to take two extra steps every time they need to get a glass over the course of a night, that's just that much less time that they have to talk to the people at the bar. Maybe the whole energy of the room you know, dips a little bit. So the function is, is really important. Um, and the aesthetics, I would say, you know, are, are equally important. Um, but our role is kind of um, more of interpretation or, or translation. Uh, especially with restaurants, um, you know, they're like in the, the project that, you know, we worked on with USHG, it's in a hotel. Um, the hotel already has an aesthetic. They're, they already had Marta, um, you know, which was a, a restaurant that had been open for a number of years that already had an aesthetic. And then they had a, a kind of a vision for what they want these two places to be like holistically and then individually. Um, so it's kind of bringing all of that together and then, you know, interpreting it in a way that uh, they feel really good about. Great. Uh, when you enter a restaurant that you haven't worked on, what do you notice if it's bad? Like, what stands out as like, this is not good? Uh, I mean, I think if, if, if there's an informal hierarchy, it's uh, lighting is usually almost the first thing. Um, light levels, like quality of light, LED is kind of, you know, slowly becoming the norm. Um, energy code make incandescent difficult to use, even if you if you want to. Um, so I think, and then distribution of light. Uh, when I first moved here, I worked at uh, Pastis. This is like 2002, uh, and kind of you know, one you know one of the first things that I noticed was like the three tier, like the pendant sconce, and then table light to kind of get that even glow. Um, that's not kind of a ubiquitous model, but usually you want people to look as good as possible. Um, <laughs> So if everyone's looking really good, then that's kind of, you know, that would be like the first. And then oddly sound is kind of, and I don't know if it's just because I'm getting older, uh, <laughs> but um, if a restaurant is too loud, uh, if the music is off and music subjective, but if the music uh, is either, you know, too loud, too soft, or just doesn't feel like it fits with the overall kind of feel of the room, um, I think those would be the first, the first two things. I notice because those are often things that hit you immediately. You know, you haven't sat down yet. You haven't talked to the server or the bartender. So um, mm -hmm. that's usually my first impression. OK. Um, we talk a lot about technology at Skip Tables. So uh, technology seems to have changed restaurant operations across the board. And I'm curious if, um, if the design has seen and good use of space has seen major changes with the advent of all the technology that's kind of happening at a, at a fast pace. It's funny. I mean, in terms of the design process, I'm, you know, the more technology, the better in terms of making, you know, how we make plans, how we make models, how we communicate intent to clients. But within the space, I think there's going to be always this kind of deep undertow of, um, 
you know, wanting to be transported and wanting to kind of escape the day to day. Uh, I was just in Greece last week, and you know, I think a lot of the charm of the restaurants there are the fact that it's you know the complete opposite. You know, everyone is. I mean, some of them are cooking everything without electricity. There's everything is handwritten. Uh, there's you know a lot of natural light. Sometimes you're eating you know open air. And you know a lot of that's not so possible here, um, or in or in most major cities. But I, I do think that our challenge a lot of the time is integrating the technology in a way that doesn't make it feel front and center. Okay, um, and we so we like to also keep it real at Skip Table. And I'm curious how far over budget uh, your <laughs> your clients tend to go. Oh, I wish they would time. go way over budget. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's generally not the case. Uh, it, it's a constant. It's a constant conversation, and I think a lot of kind of what we bring to the table is the ability of, um, you know, creating an overall solution to, um, you know, design is one aspect of a restaurant, um, and we are always trying to kind of encourage, and you know, that's what we're you know, brought on to do to kind of push the envelope a little bit in terms of the design, but also in terms of what's possible. Mm -hmm. um, and you always have to respect the, the budget and the pro forma. But, you know, if you read enough stories about how great restaurants were made, it wasn't always by, you know, not taking risks and, and not kind of being a little adventurous. Um, so I think our, our primary responsibility is to show a design that's feasible. Um, and that's possible, and we always ask for kind of budget upfront, um, mm -hmm. so that we're not creating something that's three x what they had in mind, and then we find that out too late. Right. But at the same time, you know, giving them options that say, you know, it would be really cool if we, you know, it's like the USA, you know, whoever said that you can't do this, um, you know, let's try that, and you know, maybe it's worth the risk. But also, on, on our end, having the the network of resources where. You know, we have a beautiful handmade tile, but we know where to get it for, you know, the, the price that's not an arm and a leg. Cool. Um, so it is kind of this kind of constant alchemy um, where it's pushing a little bit, but also being respectful of reality. Of course. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's talk specifics. Uh, we'll start with Cafe Marchio. Um, Terry, can you just give us a quick overview of the, the business there and what your priorities are? Yeah, so uh, Cafe Marchio is very, very specifically inspired by Rome. Um, we opened Maialino Restaurant about nine years ago, and that was our first uh, interpretation of Rome in so much as a Roman trattoria. Then when we opened Marta four years ago, that was our Roman pizzeria. And so at the time, we wanted to continue to explore what other avenues of Rome's uh, culinary culture did we want to explore, and specifically with Cafe Marchio, uh, we really, really wanted to capture the essence of the Roman coffee bar experience. And um, uh, beyond just coffee, pastries, and then also sort of things that you would enjoy throughout the day, sandwiches, salads, uh, amaro, stuff like that. So it was very much rooted in the Roman experience, which uh, in terms of uh, coffee experience, is, is very, very different from the traditional New York uh, coffee mm -hmm. shop. Cool. I'd love to hear from both of you about some of the standout design features and how they work uh, for the business. I think we have some photos, too, to show. So. Um, well, coincidentally, I mean, this doesn't always happen, um, but when we kind of were brought on and we started working on the project, I was um, going to Italy like right at the beginning of the design phase anyway. Um, so I was able to go to Rome um, and Milan. A lot of the images in our mood board um, were photos that I had taken um, kind of from walking around Rome. Um, and if there's kind of a shorthand for our process, it's, you know, it's a deep research, create a story, make it new. Um, so the research was kind of that trip, and then you know, as a team, the research we did in the studio. You can see in kind of the photo on, I guess, your Sorry. left, um, those kind of two portraits. We we usually create some sort of narrative, uh, and here, because of the coffee bar and and Vini e Fridi were kind of next to each other, but two separate uh, 
venues. We had this story about a, a mom and dad who kind of had, had created the coffee bar first and then had a daughter, and then the two decades later she had created, and this is all kind of you know, behind the scenes, you know, nobody really knows this, but just internally in terms of what the decor was and you know, how the two places would relate to each other, um, this was kind of an internal story that we had, so you, you can see it reflected in the, in the art there. But a lot of what you see, the terrazzo, that, that yellow and white tile, um, the, uh, the stonework, uh, that kind of deep, deeply stained tambour, the pebbled glass in the windows, I mean, almost all of that is a direct uh, interpretation of images that, that we saw when we were in, and specifically Rome too, not just um, other areas. Um, I, I was in, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say, uh, when we found out that uh, Oliver was going to Rome two days after, or two weeks after I think we signed you up for the project. We, you know, it was such a win because we put together a list of probably way more places than you could even fit in. Yeah. He was running a marathon too, so uh, like he didn't have a marathon. ton of time. Yeah, that's why I was going. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, I, I just remember uh, the moment when you delivered the, um, the mood board. And I remember just going, wow, this is amazing. And I sent it to Danny. And he got back immediately, and he had three words, they get it. And like it was just, he, it was, you know, the, all the work that you put into the story and how personalized it felt was, um, was music to his ears. He, I just remember him, him just saying back, there, this is it, they got it, like they Great. get Rome. That's, I'm sure that's great for you to hear. Um, can you, <laughs> from Danny Meyer. Yeah. Um, can you talk about, Terry, how people sort of move within that space? Because it is very different than a, than a coffee place that you might see on yeah. the corner. Yeah, and I think this is, one of the, this is one of those examples of you first try for something, and then sometimes you have to work with the designer to say, OK, let's figure out a plan B. If you notice in that one picture, you'll see stools. Uh, we were so adamant about the idea that in, in Rome, you don't have seats in a coffee bar. There, it's very much a stand-up experience, and it's a very quick uh, experience, whereas it, for meals like uh, lunch particularly and then dinner, it's a very, very slow, drawn-out process in Rome. They really, really uh, luxuriate over those experiences. Uh, breakfast in Rome is a pastry and a quick coffee, and but it's part of that daily ritual. And we really, really wanted to make, uh, ha uh, we really wanted to hang our hat on authenticity. And unfortunately, one of the things that we had to sort of navigate through was people came in and they would say, well, where's my stool? Where do I sit and pull my laptop out and, you know, order my coffee and, you know, uh, camp out for the next two hours. And, you know, so you get caught somewhere in between what you hope people will receive, but then the reality of what they want it to be. And I think in the world of, of hospitality, you can't, it has to be a dialogue. It can't just be a monologue. So if our guests say, we want to sit, then we're going to find that balance. So I remember uh, quickly going to Oliver and saying, we need stools <laughs> really quick. Um, but we're still trying to navigate that through. When you walk in now, there is this beautiful terrazzo counter that we still try to put a firm line and say, no stools here. But then in other areas, there's we provide stools where you can uh, sit and enjoy. Right? Yeah. I think there might be one more slide of photos of, yeah. of Marquio if you want to. Um, the one thing I would say you can't see in the pictures that I noticed is the walls are very artfully distressed, yeah. I would say, and it, 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 quite authentic. I think that was a, a lovely touch. Yeah, it's a challenge to kind of have Rome as your touch point and not have age be uh, a, 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 some, <laughs> some critical part of the conversation. Um, and, you know, it, it's, a, it's an old, beautiful building, the, the hotel, but this was a new build uh, internally, so we did have to kind of, you know, accelerate the process to a certain degree. Um, cool. Yeah, let's, I want to move um, to another related project that you work together, Vini Ifriti. Um, can you also give us an interview or an overview, please, of that, Terry? Yeah. So again, keep sticking with the theme, and we we try to, you know, we, this is something that when we first met with Oliver and the team, we tried to sort of create the the idea that 
uh, this, if, if the Redbury Hotel looking at from above, uh, we have Marta there already and then we wanted to add Vini, Fritti and Marchio, we wanted to treat it like uh, the hotel was a Roman piazza. And so there was, you had your place to go get your pizza, you had your place to go get your coffee and your pastries, and this was uh, to add to the piazza, Vini Fritti was your aperitivi bar that you could get your uh, glass of wine or your uh, Aperol spritz along with um, small, um, you know, I think one of the things culinarily wise, Rome has these wonderful uh, fried snacks like fried artichokes and soupli and all kinds of stuff. So Vini Fritti is our uh, Roman version of your uh, uh, aperitivi bar. And is it it's table service, full service? It is full service. Um, it's mostly, it's all bar height seating. Um, there's a, the bar proper and then there's four, you can see in the picture there, four uh, high top uh, tables and then a lot of on the perimeter of the space also uh, high top uh, counter service. But yes, uh, full service. Great, yeah. And again, if you could talk through some standout design features here. Uh, well, one great thing about uh, this project was, I mean, we kind of come from a, a custom build back. I mean, the first half dozen projects we did, we actually built ourselves. Um, we really think that custom work in any incarnation um, just kind of helps that accumulation of detail, which just ultimately, when it kind of comes all together, is what really makes a place stand out, even if it's subtly and last kind of throughout the years. Um, so pretty much everything you see in these photos from the lighting to the stools, the tables, the table base, um, the bar, all of the, the kind of drawings on the wall, uh, the door hardware, windows, all of it's custom. Um, I mean, I don't think there's much in here that isn't custom actually, um, which I think one helped kind of distinguish it as, you know, you're not gonna walk into any other uh, bar or restaurant and see that pendant. Um, and it also helped since we were kind of using Rome as our touchstone um, and we're in America, uh, it kind of helped us bridge the gap between, you know, having and sourcing things largely in America um, currently that are trying to feel like they belong to Rome and, and to a Roman tradition that's been there for a long time. Um, so I think in some ways it, it distinguishes it and then also helps it, you know, be a little more transportive, like when you step in, there's not as many cues as to, you know, where you are, uh, which is part of the goal. Can you, do you want to talk about how people kind of use this space, Terry, and how your, your staff and, and this, the, the general vibe, I think? Yeah, I think, you know, what I love about it is it, it's just a fun, I think they created a space that's uh, beautiful, but it doesn't feel too fancy. And so I think most people just, they've really, really embraced it as just a fun place to gather, to uh, enjoy a glass of wine or enjoy a cocktail. Uh, it is definitely um, one thing that we're really proud of is uh, it's become a good uh, industry space. So a lot of people that work in the restaurant industry really, really gravitate towards it. And that's a big compliment, I think, to what we've created because I think there is uh, in so much, so much um, experience of why people choose to be where where they want to go drink, it's because it, it's something that it just makes them feel good. Mm -hmm. um, so I love it because again, a lot of late nights people get off of work in the restaurant industry and gravitate towards there to oh, that's great. go have a drink. Yeah, yeah. high praise. Um, and I just, I, I do want to connect, kind of connect the dots between good functional design and um, a bottom line of a restaurant. You know, like this, what you've mentioned, you know, the bar, the way that a, bar, a bartender operates can affect the way that they serve customers. Um, what other small things do you notice that can actually literally affect, make or break a business in terms of um, design decisions that you make? Um, I mean, I think seat count is one, you know, I mean, multiply that by however many nights you're open a year and that could have a, a big impact. So, you know, no, how, in terms of your guest experience, you know, how many seats can we get in here? Um, I think lighting, sound, like I said, I mean, one thing that, uh, 
is a little bit kind of, uh, you don't notice a lot, but like HVAC, they have the exposed ducts here, so it's back there. But you can see that little kind of like black outline in the ceiling. Um, that's our like linear diffuser for where all the HVAC is up above the ceiling so that there was no duct. If, you know, we generally try to do that, but it would have been a challenge to have a place that, you know, was built in theory, you know, it was coming from this old tradition and kind of having these like, uh, that goes back, it's not technology per se, but just mechanical. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, really trying to kind of conceal as much as possible that isn't <coughs> an, a, something that you want the guests to relate to emotionally. Okay, great. Um, I think we probably have time for one audience question. Um, I'm going to go with this one. How do you maximize seating without giving up on back of house, uh, without giving up on back of house so execution doesn't suffer? So respecting the kitchen while also maximizing guest space. Um, I mean, I think in general, and you'll see this, you know, we're doing projects in like half a dozen other cities now, and uh, New York definitely has the highest tolerance for having your neighbor like literally next to you. Um, <laughs> Which I think, you know, is kind of got this, people complain about it, but then when you take it away from them, they complain about that too. And, <laughs> but I think, I think the first complaint is the lesser one in that people generally are going out to, to, to meet people, to like interact, and that if somebody's too far away from you, you kind of don't get that like critical mass of energy or communal feeling. Um, you know, when I worked at Pastis, they would have to, you know, pull the table out and for a two top just to get into the banquette. And I think that um, you have to address the kitchen first, you know, because if you're undersized or if you, you, you can't do what you're promising, then it doesn't matter how many seats you have. But we always try to at least create the first floor plan where it's the maximum number of seats and then kind of mock it up and say, are you comfortable with this? And, and generally speaking, uh, you know, I think that makes for, uh, we're always trying to like get people to interact. Mm -hmm. um, and you find your restaurant partners are on board with that? Mentality? Sometimes. I mean, sometimes, like, you know, we did a project in LA called Gwen where it's a much more upscale level of service and it's a tasting menu and, you know, you need a certain size table just to fit everything that is being on offer. So sometimes the program will dictate that, you know, you need a little more real estate for what they're trying to do. Um, but in general, yeah, that's our kind of our goal. Great. Great. And that's probably all the time that we have, but I want to thank you both very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this was great. Thank you. Thanks.